Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we studied the <coughs> Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we have been studying a very interesting series entitled Rebellion and Redemption. It's a series discussing issues in what we usually refer to as a cosmic conflict or the Great Controversy. And this is the concluding lesson in that series, number 13 from March 26 of 2016. Before we begin, I would like to ask you to get your Bible, and hopefully you already have it in hand as so you're prepared for this class. And I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as, as we offer a word of prayer that the Holy Spirit will guide us. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for this privilege of studying your word, of learning some very important things about the future, about the final events going to ha take place here on this earth. Help us to comprehend, to put it out, lay it out straight so that it may be understood by those who listen as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when you come to the end of something, it's often a good idea to look back and see how it got started, why it got started, what was going on there. Um, and we will try to do that with the great controversy in this lesson. To many people, there's an unanswerable question that we want to tackle a little bit today. And that question is, why did a good God create a bad world? Now, your response to that might be that that's a bad question. Um, but we need to, in order to understand the answer, to understand answers that are involved here, we must understand something about love and freedom, which are very basic to God's government. And for those of you who would like to dig into this a little bit deeper, I would encourage you to go to our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. It's O-R-G, not C-O-M. And there you'll find under Teacher's Guides, general topics, a subject entitled Love. And it explains the fact that without freedom you can't have love. And of course God is love. And what he wants most of all in his kingdom is a loving response from us. Therefore he must allow freedom. And that's a problem. Is it clear in your mind why God didn't wipe out Satan from the beginning? And his followers? I mean, couldn't God have just wiped them out when they started the rebellion in heaven? Not if he's love. Not if he's love. Well, that's, that's another condition you threw in there. Uh, where if God were the kind of person that Satan has claimed that he is, arbitrary and unforgiving and severe, he should have just said, okay, Satan, if you're going to make a, you're going to cause a problem here, just zap, you're gone. And it would have come back again. Yes. And again. And again. Of course, God could have, in his foreknowledge, said, I know who is going to cause problems, just not create them. What would that do? No love. It means, it means that our freedom is wiped out, doesn't it? God runs, and this is the incredible thing, an open and absolutely transparent government. Nothing is done behind closed doors. Now imagine what it would be like if we had a government here in the world, our world today that was like that. When he's finished, everyone will agree that God has been fair and honest with everything he has done, even fair and honest to the devil himself. No questions will be left about God's character of self-denial, goodness, justice, righteousness, love, or law. God will not bring the great controversy to an end until everyone, and that means everyone, including Satan himself, agrees that God has done everything possible to save every single person he can. How do you think he's going to accomplish that? Uh, let me just give you the evidence first. You know the passage in Philippians 2, 9-11. Philippians 2, 9-11. For this reason, God raised him to the highest places, talking about the, how Jesus came down and, and lived here on this earth as a human being, actually died a criminal's death. And this, for this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, here's the conclusion, 
in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below. Now, who does that include? It doesn't leave anybody out, really. It doesn't leave anybody out, including the Satan himself, will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All that happens because of a name? Well, let's think about that. How, what, what, what's going to bring that about? How is it going to happen? Well, people will become convinced uh, the entire universe will have seen this sin business play out and how it, um, there's nothing profitable in it. It destroys everything that it touches, even causes those who are the perpetrators to want to kill God himself. Mm -hmm. And they will see this is something that doesn't work. And just like God said it, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And God's right. Mm -hmm. So if, if everybody's convinced, why is it that people have to die? That's a good question. And that's one of the main reasons why we're main parts of our lesson for today. So let's work on that one. You want to give a short answer? Or you want <laughs> me to give a short answer? Greg, you, you can give a Because break. those people, even though they admit that God is correct, they do not change. They are still rebels and they want to stay as rebels. So Good. it doesn't sound like they've been convinced to me. They are convinced, but they are not changed. Here's, here, here, let me give you an example. Let me, let me see. You can go to a movie. I don't go to movies, but you could go to a movie, a really, some really powerful movie, and you, could, and you hear people talk about this, and you could be brought to tears, you could be brought to just hilarious laughter in one movie. It, and that's not because something has changed in you. It's because of what's presented before you. God is going to show the entire history of the great controversy from beginning to end. And Ellen White says no one is going to be able to take their eyes off it, not even Satan himself. He's going to see exactly what part you played in every step of that way. And it's going to be so compelling that Steven Spielberg will turn green. I mean, this is going to be 3D living color. Okay, and when it's done, just without even realizing what they're doing, Satan and his, and his, his followers are going to fall on the ground and say, yes, God, you did it right. And then they're going to jump up and say, what are we doing? It's, it's just that they're, they're overcome with the compelling information that, that's presented in that, in that panorama. Sounds like a feeling to me. Well, it, it, maybe it is a feeling. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's just that they 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 see absolutely where they went wrong, what has been the result, and the fact that there's no longer a chance for them to change. Why do we? Uh, and let's talk. We need to talk about how that happens and when it happens. <clears throat> yes. Why isn't that evident um, at the cross? Why it, can't? Why? Why? Why couldn't, why, why isn't it a legitimate argument that at that point, at that time in history, it ought to be pretty well obvious what the situation is? How could, how could the universe say anything else? So why, if that's the case, if that's a, log, if that's a reasonable argument, if it's a, if it's a right argument, yeah. then why, why are we still running around down here? What, what else is there to Very prove? Very good question. There's, there's two or three answers to that, depending on who you're talking about. The rest of the universe was convinced, except for Satan and his angels. And they realize that they've lost. There's nothing more they can do about it. And so they're, they're enraged. That's their response. They're enraged. But still not converted. And still not converted. We humans are still here 2,000 years later because... How many, what percentage of human beings can give you a good explanation of why Jesus had to die? Well, but... Somewhere close to zero. But what percentage is required? Do well, we need 10%? Asking, Do we need 50%? Well, but obviously, we'd like everybody to know. I mean, if they're going to make a choice about whether they belong to God's side or Satan's side, they should know that information, right? 
Well, but how will that come about? I mean, each day I grow more and more aware of that, mm -hmm. but that's because I'm getting older and I have more experience on this earth. Yeah. There are people coming along here that don't have the experience that I'm going to have. I'm going to die, and then there's going to be other people coming along who were just like I was yesterday who don't have as complete knowledge. Yeah. There will always be, it would seem, yeah. unless there is unless there is some cataclysmic yes. thing that comes, but why does it have to come later? Why couldn't it have come a thousand years ago? Yes, good question. And part of the answer is going to be found in one chapter in the Bible, and that's Revelation 20. <clears throat> what happens in Revelation 20? A lot of things. <laughs> okay. Can you mention one? The millennium. The millennium. The big thing that's found in Revelation 20 that's not found anywhere else in the Bible is the millennium. So there's going to be, and I, I unfortunately we don't have time to go through all this, but just uh, I will say that I'm fully convinced, and this is a position that's generally acknowledged by the Seventh Adventist Church at least, there's going to be a second coming. There's going to be a thousand years when the righteous are in heaven, looking over the books of heaven and agreeing that God has done everything fair and right and in a righteous manner. The devil and his angels are going to be stuck here on this earth with nothing but dead, wicked people to deal with. They, don't have, a, they have to spend a thousand years thinking about what they've caused. And after that period of time, the wicked are going to be raised, the new Jerusalem is going to come down to this earth, the righteous are going to be, actually, Ellen White says they're going to come down here first, then they're going to enter the new Jerusalem. And there's some things that happen, but finally, as the new Jerusalem is, is prepared to get established as the, the head of this earth, Satan and his forces gather around the new Jerusalem, we're going to attack it, and he says, we're, there's so many of us out here, we can conquer this place, let's just conquer it, and, and, and we'll get to the tree of life and we'll live forever. And about that time, Jesus is lifted up above the New Jerusalem. He is, he is crowned as king of the universe, and then the panorama starts, and that's the point where nobody can take their eyes off of it. Every person who has ever lived will, be, will, be, will see that panorama, and each person will recognize part he has had in it. So, and Adventists, because of our understanding of the great controversy, are the only ones who have some kind of an explanation for that. Now, let's work through those details. Um, after the thousand years, Satan is to be let loose. And this really puzzles. The people who believe that the thousand years on earth is, is going to be a period of time on this earth when there's peace and righteousness because Satan is bound why in the world would anyone let, it, let him go? Well, look at this passage. This is first of all from Ellen White. While deprived of his power and cut off from his work of deception, during the, this is during the millennium, the prince of evil was miserable and dejected. But as the wicked dead are raised and he sees the vast multitudes upon his side, his hopes revive and he determines not to yield the great controversy. He will marshal all the armies of the lost under his banner and through them endeavor to execute his plans. The wicked are Satan's captives. Okay, but what will, uh, what will bind Satan? Satan will be bound by circumstances, by being confined to this earth because no inhabitant of the rest of the universe will listen to him, and not by physical force like many of the people described in the Bible that Jesus healed. So what does, I mean, one of the questions is, what does binding mean in the New Testament, or in the Bible, in all of the, all of the Bible? What does binding mean? Well, group together and... <clears throat> we can't travel around to other parts of the universe, so... That's okay. What if we're talking about Satan. Yeah, if we're yeah, yeah right. Yeah. But, but just think about the term in general. Make sure that we, I mean, Peter and Paul were bound in, as prisoners. Uh, but it also talks about people being bound by their disease, being bound by the devil, and so forth like this. So it's not just imprisoned as in physical binding and thrown into a, Metal a lock sale. It, it, it could be a lot of things, okay? Um, look at what some people have said about this binding and its, its consequences. One person said, but why is Satan merely bound? Why is he ever to be loosed again? I mean, to a lot of people, 
if Satan is bound, and, and remember the, the passage, maybe we should look at that just briefly. What does it say about the binding of Satan in Revelation, 12, in Revelation 20? Remember? Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the abyss and a heavy chain. Now this sounds like physical binding, doesn't it? He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, that is the devil or Satan, who wants to make sure you know who he's talking about, and chained him up for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the abyss, locked it and sealed it so that he could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were over. After that, he must be let loose for a little while. And we'll talk about that must be let loose a little bit later. But notice when he's bound, what's, what happens to him? He could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were over. That's what happened when he's bound. And what, how, what, how does that come about? We've already suggested. There's no live people here left to work on, right? Another man, man said, why, once Satan has been securely sealed in the abyss, must he be let loose? Because that's what Revelation says, to wreak further havoc. And what claim does he have on God that God is bound to give the devil his due? Another commentator said, but why theologically must he be loosed to deceive the nations? Why did he have to come down to earth with great wrath, as pictured in Revelation 12, 12? Why could he not be liquidated from the beginning? I mean, wouldn't that be... I mean, if you were running an ordinary business here on earth, and someone came in and just was absolutely bent on messing the whole thing up, what would you do? Get rid of them, right? And another commentator just says, what's the point? One more. Why not simply destroy Satan at the beginning of the thousand year period? Why is it important that Satan is not destroyed during the millennial period? And these guys don't have answers to this question. These questions they're raising. If it wasn't, if it wasn't Satan that was causing the problem, in, inevitably somebody would have caused the problem. Yeah. And that's the problem with of freedom, and yeah. that's the problem of love. Yeah. Somebody's going to make a choice, yeah. and the choice is either be in harmony with the Creator or be self-centered. Yep. Well, R. H. Charles, a, Charles, a very famous commentator that done a lot of work in the New Testament, even in the in the um, Pseudepigrapha, the Apocrypha, and the Pseudepigrapha, and so forth. All that work there, he said, when John John died. This is real speculation, a real crazy notion. He said John died when he had completed Revelation 20, verse 3 of his uh, work and that the materials for its completion, which were for the most part ready in a series of independent documents, were put together by a faithful but unintelligent disciple in the order which he thought right. I might have, <laughs> we can speculate as to why he did that because R.H. Charles is a, Put, uh, compiled the uh, pseudepigrapha, uh, two huge volumes yeah. of the pseudepigrapha, so he's read a lot of fanciful materials. Yeah. So did he have an order that it was supposed to be in? Well, no, he doesn't come up with that either. He just mm -hmm. says, from, from Re Revelation 20, verse 3, the rest of it doesn't, just, it's just a hodgepodge of stuff, it doesn't make any sense. That's his version of things. So... Um, the devil being loosed. Um, does, there's no reason for it. It doesn't make any sense to him. Yeah. Can't do it. If you don't have a great controversy, there's no reason for it. So it makes sense to us because of what? <laughs> the great controversy. <laughs> well, I know, but... Um, God has been accused. And he's God been has, accused. But why, did, why would God put him down for a thousand years and then let him go again? Well, okay. Why, what, okay, well, the purpose of the thousand years first, what's that? Okay, we're going to get into that in more detail, but let's just hit it very quickly. The thousand years is a period of time in which the righteous are taken to heaven. They're allowed to look over all the books, and they're allowed to see exactly why God has made all the decisions that he has made about the judgment. The first decision, the first judgment period is going on right now. started in 1844, as we Seventh-day Adventists believe, God in the pre-advent judgment. Then the thousand years is given to the righteous. If they want to ask any questions about the judgment, the book's open. Like I said, God's government is absolutely transparent. This is their chance. So then when they come down, when the New Jerusalem comes back down to this earth and the, the righteous are in it, and they, there and once again, 
They don't have any questions about why things are the way they are. It's only the wicked outside, and God doesn't even destroy the wicked until they see why. So no one in the universe will be left with any questions about why things were done the way they were and where, what their part is in it and why they're either inside or outside the city. It'll be transparently clear to everybody, even the wicked. And Ellen White says, as a result of that, the wicked will turn on the pastors who have misled them. So, so what's being shown when he gets let go? Well, it's gonna, it, it'll show that even if, you, even if you give him all the evidence, as in the panorama, Satan is still determined. See, when that panorama is over, what does he try to do? He tells his crew, jump up quick, let's attack the city. And they're saying, you're the scoundrel that got us into this mess, and they turn on him. <coughs> it, the, what's going to happen is, it's going to be self-destruction outside the city. We're going to see the full results, and we'll get to this eventually. Isaiah 66, 23 says, by the time God's cleansing flames pour out of the city and over the, the, the it's going to be nothing but dead bodies out there. Well, let me look at a couple of others. A German gentleman said, after the capture of the beast, the seer has lost interest in the story. So, it says he's captured in Revelation 20, the first part of verse 3. Okay, the story's over now. We don't need to explain anything that happens after that. Even William Barclay, one of my favorite commentators, said, Here is our key. The origin of this doctrine is not specifically Christian, but is to be found in certain Jewish beliefs about the Messianic age, which were common in the time of after 100 B.C. I mean, these are, these are people who are scholars. You know, some of the best scholars, best Bible students in the last 150 years. So they think that the end of Revelation should end as soon as the dragon is... Well, I mean, they say, okay, if you suggest that there's some kind of battle going on, they see it as just a battle between good and evil. So if you finally capture the evil guy and you locked him up, why would you let him out again? That's the question. Gordon, you look like and you're ready. not out on probation. You're not out on probation. <coughs> well, <coughs> as we approach the end of this earth's history, <coughs> is there a danger that Satan will try to bind us? <coughs> God promised us, and, and I, in, in, in all this binding and stuff, we need to think about this for a minute. God promises you and me that if necessary, he would send every angel in heaven to our aid rather than to allow us to be overcome. Here's the quotation, Ellen G. White, Testimonies, Volume 7, page 17. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul who feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. God would send every angel in heaven to the aid of such a one rather than allow him to be overcome. That's a real promise. And she comments about the devil's work with Adam and Eve. The angels warned them, that is Adam and Eve, to be on their guard against the devices of Satan. Some people have asked, well, you know, weren't they, weren't they warned about the tree? Well, here it says yes. The angel, even the angels warned them. For his efforts to ensnare them would be unwearied. While they were obedient to God, the evil one could not harm them. For if need be, every angel in heaven would be sent to their help. Patriarchs and Prophets, 53, paragraph 2. So, we, we, there's no way Satan can bind us unless we're willing, to, we're, we're willing to be bound. So that part of the argument should be over. Okay? Well, so let's go through the sequence now. Here we are in a wicked world and things are getting worse and worse. What happens next? Without going into, I mean, the big events. I don't, we don't have time to work through the step by step by step by step. Second coming is the next huge The next event. huge big event is the second coming. And what happens at the second coming? The righteous dead are raised and uh, along the with righteous the living? righteous living ascend to heaven. Okay, what happens to the wicked? They stay asleep. 
or okay. are, are killed. For those of you who, who want to look that up, John 14, 1 to 3 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 tell us that the righteous will be, the righteous dead will be raised and, and they will be taken to heaven. The rest of the dead will remain on this earth until the thousand years are over, and that's in Revelation 20, verse 5. Let's just look at that for a second. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. Okay? Pretty clear, right? Is that what they talk about when they say some will be taken and some will be left? Mm -hmm. So look at Revelation 20, verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been executed because they had proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed in the Word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. Now, what's, an, what's the other, another word for that thousand years? Millennium. Millennium. Millennium is just a Latin word for a thousand years. So the righteous will be in heaven reviewing the records, right? Anybody have a question about that? Why so long? A thousand years, that's a long time. Yeah. We got the rest of eternity. Couldn't they put that on fast forward? <laughs> well, we'll see. God, God knows what he's doing. There's a reason why he's chosen to do it that way. Of course, way. they might be enjoying uh, sure. the company up there. Sure. So when they're judging, what are they looking for? Well, let me give you a common example which is given. Suppose you have a cousin or an aunt or an uncle or a mother even that you thought was a saint, and she's not there. You're going to ask questions, right? And God says, here's the record. Look for yourself. See what you so, would do. More. So it looks like you're going to be justifying why somebody isn't going to be there. Well, you're going to be finding out why God did what he did and why he made the judgments he did. And by the time that thousand years is over, I'm sure each one of us is going to be so convinced of the rightness of God that there will be no question left. I, I still don't quite understand what they're looking for, though. Well, doesn't, doesn't Jesus say that he judges no one? Mm -hmm. Isn't the person that made the, uh, themselves that makes the judgment call ultimately really? And, and why is that? Because God has just set up a very clear standard. There's no question about his standard. But it's not arbitrary. No, it's not arbitrary. I mean, it's, it's purely the way things are want to function. And for those that do, would not be comfortable, it would be hell for them. Yeah. Wait, isn't this part of this figuring out whether the standard is good or not? Of course. Well, yeah, sure. So how if you don't know you if that, that standard is good, well, then how are you going to judge by that standard? No, you okay, oh, no, I'll give you a, an earthly example of that an earthly example of that. We have huge brouhaha's in Congress when one of the Supreme Court justices decides to retire. And the president, who's currently in charge, is expected to choose the next Supreme Court leader. And why is there such a big deal over that? Aren't they all supposed to be judging exactly according to the law? Well, either according to the law or to what they think the law is. Okay, and that's the point. That's what you end up with. That's exactly <laughs> right. Or what they want the law to be. Well, that's another, another issue, yes. Yeah. So, what ha so the reason people argue about that, because they know that some of the judges tend to lean one way and some of the judges tend to lean the other way, and that's very clear. And our, our country has been served reasonably well down through the years and years, because the Supreme Court has tended to be, ended up being somewhat balanced. Well, they make their choice. Doesn't mean that it's right, though. You're well, saying that it's more or less being. balanced yeah. by whose judgment is that going to be from? Well, but the point Whether is... Whether it works or not? The point is, if you're now looking at God's judgment, he's not going to make any mistakes. And after you've figured that out about a thousand times, you're going to say, wow, this guy's great. So now, the, 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 the judging that's going to be going on during the thousand years, mm -hmm. if, if, if that's so successful, then why do we need that big panorama later on? Well, the panorama is primarily for the dead, the, right, the wicked, 
that, that aren't there during the thousand years. I see. This is, this is a chance for them to see why they're not inside that city. So are our good folks going to be down there watching that too? or is that All of us. It's going to be that from the people inside the city and the people outside the city, all of us are going to watch that panorama. So is that the, for the sake of speed? Well, I mean, how long do you want to, do you want <laughs> this process to go on? Well, if, if that works fast, why come they does, he doesn't do the panorama for, a, for the righteous and then make it less than a thousand years? Well, I'll let you well, ask because there's question. a. <laughs> there's a, there's a wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't do that kind of like, stuff. I mean, I'm asking you a question, and you got to come up with, you got to <laughs> at least give it a chance. Well, you don't I, go say, well, when you get there, you can ask him. The, right? the, you can't do that. <laughs> well, but there's, during that thousand years, during that thousand years, there's two things going on. There's one thing that's going on in heaven, and there's something going on down here on earth. And they both both have their purpose and they're playing out. So, um, part, part of that thousand years is Satan is down here slowly, slowly realizing what a mess he's created and there's not a chance in the world for him to get out of it in any way. Which is a very sad thing yeah. when you think about it. Very sad. He can't get out of it. Yeah. Is that because he wants to or that he doesn't want to? It's because he's so proud and so selfish that he will not change. God would accept him back if it were, if it were possible. But he, he, he just, he's so self-deceived. He, uh, he, he sounds like some politicians we've heard of recently. <laughs> so, so absolutely certain that their way is the right way that they, don't, they can't even hear anybody else. What about the third that were cast down or the Revelation 12, 4, mm -hmm. weren't, are they still functioning with? with yeah, those are, those so, are the, so what we're talking about, it's almost an end up with a 50-50 in the grand scheme of everything. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a remnant, which is less than half mm -hmm. of, of the human a lot, beings. A lot less than half. Of the human beings, and it was a third of the uh, angels. angels, according to Revelation 12, 4. So uh, it's still, it's kind of a toss-up, looks like. Okay, so it's well, the, and and Satan convinces the wicked as they surround the city right. of God at, at the third at the third coming. It's going to seem to them like there's so many of us out here. Yeah. We're going to be able to get into this city. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. Well, th let me read you the words. This is Ellen White's comment in page in in uh, Great Controversy six sixty one. Um. In union with Christ, they judge the wicked, comparing their acts with the statute book, the Bible, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. So what's, what are they judging? They're judging the actual behavior of each person. Then the portion which the wicked must suffer is meted out according to their works, and it is recorded against their names in the book of death. Now, so, some people... Yeah? So if we're having this, this judgment and decision-making a thousand years in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have some more down here when heaven comes down here. What's the purpose of the pre-advent judgment? Why are, who's, okay. who's looking at that? Okay, stop and think about this for a minute. Okay. Right now, who's involved in the judgment? Well, it would be God in the officially in any kind of official capacity. One would assume that's that's God and maybe Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but you have all of these, the onlooking universe sure. who are... Exactly. <coughs> so right now, the pre-advent judgment is for the benefit of the onlooking universe. God, doesn't, God does not need to take one second. He already knows mm -hmm. who's savable and who's not savable. Because that's really the question. The only question ultimately is, is it safe for this person or this being to spend the rest of eternity in heaven? Or will they just start the great controversy all over again? That's the question. And God already knows the answer to that. But and, maybe and you and I don't. That's going to be the people who are saved. Yes. So right now it's the onlooking universe that are, that are seeing the... Any so the assessment is about you and me. Yeah. But then when we go to heaven, then really we're kind of... We're kind of validating God. Exactly. It's more of a, a judgment of God is kind of a strong term, but in a sense, um, 
that's kind of, it's not a judgment, but it's, a, it's an assessment of what has been done, their part in this exactly. thing. Exactly. And so at the end of the pre-advent judgment, there's the second coming. And what happens to the righteous at the second coming? Taken to heaven. They're taken to heaven. What happens to the wicked? They die. They die or they're already dead here. So the, de the definitive action happens at the end of the pre-advent judgment. So nothing is going to change during that thousand years in terms of where someone goes. Not, we're not going to say, oops, God, you made a mistake. God didn't make mistakes. So if, if um, the assessment about, about my worthiness mm -hmm. is made <clears throat> before the second coming, mm -hmm. then that's kind of pretty well settled. Mm -hmm. And then after the, the, during the thousand years, we pretty well get that settled about God. Mm -hmm. why, is it really, why is it really essential? It's like we have the good people are assessed, God is assessed. Now we're coming down here and assessing the wicked. The wicked. Why? Why is it necessary to? How? How? What? What assessment is? Okay, I want you to listen to this very carefully. I want you to think about this. God is not willing to let even a single one of His children die without being convinced that they're the right place, either saved or lost, and they will know themselves. We'll see that in a quotation coming up here in a moment. They will know themselves why they are where they are. So when, when, that, when the new earth is created, the new heavens and the new earth are created, there will be not one person anywhere, no one for the rest of eternity, will have any questions about God's fairness, about His righteousness, about His judgment, never be questioned again. So even the guilty... Even the guilty. He is concerned that even the guilty understand. Exactly. Of course, so there are those in Matthew seven twenty two. Lord, Lord, I cast out devils in your name. I did miracles in your name, and God said, I never knew you. And they're going to see why, and they're going to understand what's going on after they see the panorama. They're going to see why they didn't really do mm -hmm. it in God's name. So evidently, they're saying that before. Mm -hmm. Again, they change their minds. <laughs> let me take you to the page earlier from what we just read. At this time, the righteous reign as kings and priests unto God. John in the Revelation says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 20, 4 and 6. It is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, the saints shall judge the world. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Satan also and evil angels. This is... On the next page, six, Great Controversy 661, paragraph 1. <coughs> Satan also and evil angels are judged by Christ and his people. Says Paul, know ye not that we shall judge angels? Verse, that's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. And Jude declares that, quote, the angels which kept not their first estate. Now, who would that be? The angels who kept not their first estate, who didn't remain where they were supposed to be. That would be the wicked angels. But left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the, of the great day, Jude 6. Okay? So, just to review again, nobody changes their mind at this point in time. That all the, my, the decisions about who's going to be where happens at the second coming. God is already separated from righteous from the wicked. So our judging will only accomplish what again? Jay, you said it a moment ago. Actually, my mind was wandering when you were yeah. well, heading we're, down we're this the, direction here. So. We're, what happens during that thousand years is we're, yes, Gordon. Yeah, we're confirming but in God our is, own minds that God was right mm -hmm. in his judgments. Yep. Which would evidently imply that prior to that we weren't quite completely sure. We didn't have the information. Hmm. Okay, now but let's... You and I have it right here. We have We it. should. About God. But I don't have it about... Me. Aunt, Aunt Joan or whatever. I see, okay. Got okay. some questions about Aunt Joan. Let, uh, <laughs> let's, let's deal with your question again. I want to make this very clear because so many people, so few people really understand it. 
the Bible speaks about three times of judgment. And you can actually break it down into smaller, even more than three, but three major times of judgment. One, the pre-advent judgment in which God reviews all the records for the benefit of the onlooking universe. That judgment began in 1844 and continues until the second coming. Two, the millennium, when the righteous are allowed to review what God has done and will end up agreeing with all his judgments. So what are we doing during the millennium? Agreeing with God. Confirming his rightness, his judgment. Three, God will finally carry out a final executive judgment. What's, a, what's an executive judgment? Kind of take an action here to finalize. When you, when you take action based on what the judgment says, right? <clears throat> An executive judgment at the time of the third coming. All the wicked will come to life and every person who has ever lived will be present for that judgment. And here's the Matthew 7, here's the Revelation 20. Let's just look at Revelation 27 to 9. After the thousand years are over, Satan will be let loose from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations scattered over the whole world. Now we read in Revelation 4, I think it was, that he's bound because there's nobody to tempt. What happens now? The wicked are raised from the dead again, so now he has people to tempt and he's all excited. He's let out of his prison. Satan will bring them all together from battle as many as the grains of sand on the seashore. They spread out over the earth and surround the camp of God's people in the city that he loves. But fire came down from heaven and destroyed them. And that's jumping over. There's parts that happen in the middle there. Um, after Satan prepares his forces, and by the way, as I said, that's the time when the great panorama happens. And even the devil ends up on his knees saying, yes, God, you did everything right. And, then he's, and he will jump up and say, what am I doing down on my knees? He, he, the this, this picture will be so compelling. They will, people will be so caught up in the, the whole theme of things that they will be and then they will say whoa what am I doing so after Satan prepares his forces to surround and attack the New Jerusalem suddenly they will be stopped in their tracks as the throne of God is lifted high above the city and as Jesus is crowned king then a great panorama will take place in which the great controversy from beginning to end would be pictured in fantastic reality what and is Jesus going to be crowned of, king of? The universe, for the rest of eternity. Well, what about God the Father? He's not mm -hmm. going, to be, going to be a prince, is well, he? Do, do you want me to read what it actually says about that? I read it to you once already. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and the world below will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. So and he says, together. nobody has ever seen the Father except him. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the interesting thing, and I wish I had time to go into more detail. As soon, this is quoting, this is Ellen White. I'm going to read from, uh, pick out two or three passages from Great Controversies, pages 666 to 668. Try to give you the overall view really quickly. As soon as the books of record are opened, now this is at the third coming, and the eyes of Jesus look upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. So who judges them really? They judge themselves. God just enlightens their memory. <coughs> just, you, know, you know, you can you can put an electric probe, I should ask Dennis, I mean Dennis, I should ask Gordon about this. You can put little probes into the brain and people all of a sudden light up, they can see something that happened to them in the past just like it's right there. It's recorded there. So as soon as the books of record open the, uh, and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. They see just wh where their feet uh, diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if written in letters of fire. Now that's going to be the panorama, okay? <coughs> Above the throne is revealed the cross, and like a panoramic 
view appear the scenes of Adam's temptation and fall and the successive steps in the great plan of redemption. The awful spectacle appears just as it was. Satan, his angels, and his subjects have no power to turn from the picture of their own work. Their eyes are glued, not because they want to be, but because it's so compelling. It is now evident to all that the wages of sin is not noble independence and eternal life, but slavery, ruin, and death. The wicked see what they have forfeited by their life, of rebellion. Great controversy, as I said before, 666 through 668. So the wicked see what they've done, but they don't change. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, the onlooking universe, the righteous and the wicked, will be fully satisfied that God has done everything he possibly could to save as many as possible. Then finally, the wicked will begin to realize who has deceived them and why they are lost. They will turn on each other as God's glory is gradually allowed to shine more and more upon them until all of them, including Satan, are gone. Now, if you want to do your homework, I'll help you. There's a handout we have we've put together. I spent years on this one, entitled The Final End of Sin and Sinners. It's almost exclusively, well, it's a collection of quotations from the Bible and from Ellen White. You can find it at our website www.theox.org if you get our handout you can just click on the little link there it uh, you go to teachers guides look for new and resources or you can go to where's the other place it's on, on the same place as love general topics general topics uh, teachers guides look for the handout entitled the final end of sin and sinners 73 pages to give you the minute details then god having melted this earth with incredible heat, 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12, will make a new heaven and a new earth. I had one friend who said, God will probably just use that energy. He collects when all the old stuff is melted to make something new. I don't know how God does it, but that's a possibility. No shortness of energy on the part of God, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's you not around good. collecting. I'm not going to be beholden to that small. <laughs> no. <laughs> The New Jerusalem will certainly be large enough to give ample room to all the redeemed as well as the heavenly angels. What size is the New Jerusalem, according to Revelation? Is it five miles high? Is that correct? Oh, 1,500 miles. 1,500. Well, it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, and one passage says it's as high as it is wide and broad, so we don't know it's if it's... It's big. If it's, a, it's big. Big enough to fit everyone. Big enough to fit everyone. Well, if it was 1,500 miles square, what did they figure you could put all the people... Uh, well, I, I was just figuring the square, not, not yeah. the height. But they figure you could put all the people in the state of Texas or something and have 400, uh, yeah, they, 400 square feet someone, or something. Someone, someone calculated you could take everyone who's ever lived, if you, if you squeeze them together and put them in the state of Texas. And they'd have about three or 400 square feet per person. Yeah. At one uh, time, it was the state of Washington, but that, yeah. that was 15, 20 years yeah. ago, so... So the city of God that God has made will come down to this earth and it will be beyond our imagination. And who else will be living here? God. Besides human beings? God's going to. God the Father, move, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the headquarters here. Exactly. All the angels. This is going to be the headquarters of the universe for the rest of eternity, as far as we know. I like what passage where it says there's not going to be a sun there. Yeah. Because Jesus shines, shines so brightly. It was at Revelation 21 yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Well, there's some other things that said, look at Revelation 21, <coughs> 3 to 5. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. <coughs> he will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. He also said to me, Write this, because these words are true and can be trusted. Why is there going to be <coughs> tears at that point in time? At the end of the thousand years? Because God will have lost many of his children. Yeah, exactly. Never see them you, again. Yeah. In fact, one of his brightest kids, 
the devil. Yeah. It's going to be gone, and God will never see him again. <coughs> one third of his everyone, enemies. everyone outside the city who perishes is one of God's children. Do you think? A little speculation here. Do you think after you've had the tears wiped from your eyes, you could go up to God and said, "It's okay, God. You did everything you possibly could to save them." Would that be appropriate? Well, I certainly think that will be the case. It's not going to be God up there like so many Christians believe and so many other people with other religions. God's going to be up there with his, you know, righteous sword or whatever and thinking how just it is that he's destroying these wicked people. Not at all. God's going to be weeping as these people perish. They are his children. It has always been God's plan to dwell with his creatures in a loving relationship and you can look at the verses there, Exodus 25, 8, John 1, 14, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, Revelation 21, 3. God has always wanted to be as close as possible to us, to dwell with us, to live with us. If we had time, we could show definitively that the millennium occurs before the final destruction of the lost. It should also be clear that God allows the righteous to review the records in heaven so that they all will accept the fact that God has been completely fair. The truth about sin and its consequences must be demonstrated to the satisfaction of the entire universe once and for all. Why is that so important? So that sin doesn't happen again. Okay, and I'm going to read you a couple of passages. I'm sorry, I'm reading lots of, uh, but I mean, these, Ellen White and the Bible say it so much better. This is Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889. Okay? Very interesting passage. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. You asked the question before, why isn't it all over at the end? Well, the answer is not everybody understands about the death of, 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 of Jesus. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross, notice, it is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Now, how does that work? Did Jesus die for sinless angels too? Absolutely. Where would you get that idea? From Ellen White. Mm -hmm. in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians yep. 1, 9 and 10, and yep. John 12, 32, and so With, on. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Human per angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden, the paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. And what does that mean? I mean, we just look at him and... Oh, look, he... look, listen, and learn. Uh -huh. That's what God is a teacher. <clears throat> is a, as a parent, the duty of a parent is to <clears throat> teach the kids. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an <clears throat> eternal safeguard. How long does that last? Generally. An eternal safeguard against defection and unfallen words as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So, what's our safety? Remembering the cross. Look back the plan of salvation. I'm sure that panoramic view is going to be prepared and God's going to have it available. If anyone needs to go back and review it, they can review it at any time. Right? Well, who shall not fear thee, O Lord? Here's another passage from Ellen White. And glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. What does it mean God's judgments are made manifest? We recognize the rightness of his judgments. Every question of truth and error in the long-standing controversy has now been made plain. 
The results of rebellion, their fruits of setting aside the divine statutes, have been laid open to the view of all created intelligences. All created intelligences, right? The working out of Satan's rule in contrast with the government of God has been presented to the whole universe. So now we can see. You follow Satan, this is what happens. You follow God, this is what happens. Do, how could it be more, any plainer than that? Satan's own works have condemned him. God's wisdom, his justice, and his goodness stand fully vindicated. It is seen that all his dealings in the great controversy have been conducted with respect to the eternal good of his people and the good of all the worlds that he has created. What does that mean? If we follow God's commands, it's really for whose benefit? For ours. It's really for our benefit. All thy works pra shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. The history of sin will stand to all eternity. Now, I said before it was an e eternal safeguard. Here it says the history of sin will stand to all eternity as a witness that with the existence of God's law is bound up the happiness of all the beings he has created. In other words, the only way to run a happy, loving, unconflicted universe is by following God's government. With all the facts of the great controversy in view, the whole universe, both loyal and rebellious, with one accord declare, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. See, who's going to declare that? Both loyal and rebellious, with one accord. Everybody's going to proclaim it. So is the history of the final end of sin and sinners clear to you? What questions do you still have? Do you think a thousand years will be enough time, we discussed that, for you to be satisfied that God's judgment was fair? Well, as soon as the wicked are raised to life at the second resurrection, Satan will be feverishly busy again, tempting and deceiving them. He will try to surround the city and conquer it. And when God's glory is finally poured out at full strength onto the surface of this world and it consumes the wicked, it will be, Isaiah 66, 23 and 24, dead bodies that are consumed. Are we willing to accept that? Do we understand all that's involved there? Are we willing to vote for God's side and co fully commit to that? Our loving Father in heaven, what a privilege it is for us to have these insights into the future. Help us not even to consider casting our lot on Satan's side, but be faithful to your side as the only side that has any chance of surviving for eternity is our prayer in Jesus' name.